All right, so why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, I want to welcome you all to our Michigan Biostatistics Virtual Prospective Student Day. Uh, this is something we've been doing uh, since COVID started, and it's something I think we're going to continue to do even once we are more or less past the pandemic, as maybe we are approaching at this point, although I don't think we're past yet, um, uh, because it, it's been a great way to reach out to people all over the country and honestly all over the world, and we're always interested to see where, where people come from, and we're just delighted that you've decided to, to spend some time here with us this evening, Eastern time, uh, and all sorts of different times, I'm sure, around the world. So I am Mike Benke. Um, let's see, what do I need to do here? I need to enable, I guess. Uh, I'm chair of our student recruitment committee. And um, uh, along with Kelly Kidwell, um, your host uh, for the um, for the prospective uh, student day this evening. So uh, Kelly has put up our agenda uh, for this evening. I'll talk for a little bit. Uh, about the department uh, and, and the field of biostatistics. Kelly will then uh, talk about the department programs, admissions, and financial support. We'll then have a student panel uh, with eight of our current students talking about their graduate student experience uh, and um, uh, taking your questions and answers. We'll have a little bit of time left over at the end for more questions and answers. And um, then at 8.30, for those who are an hour and a half from now, depending on your time zone, uh, for those who would like to stay around, uh, several of us will stay around another half hour to chat. Um, and we might do that all together. Uh, if it's a small number, or we might go into individual breakout rooms. And Alicia Dominguez has kindly agreed to moderate that session. Uh, next slide, please. So a few ground rules since we, we, I think we're all pretty used to using Zoom and other such things at this point, but just given we're getting to be a largest group my suggestion is when individual talks are going on to please post your questions into the chat. Um, some of those questions, if they're simple, can probably be answered directly at that point. Um, and then when a question, sorry, when a session is done, when a talk is done, please feel free to continue putting your questions in chat or to just um, unmute yourself and, and, and speak up. And we'd be delighted to, to do it that way. Um, my sincere apologies if a question in the chat gets missed. It's easy to do, unfortunately. And particularly if it's a question you'd like and it hasn't been uh, answered, please feel free to speak up and, and we'll do it that way. Um, or also feel free to contact us after uh, the prospective student day event is over. Um, we'd love to chat with you and uh, uh, always around and interested in doing so. And also just to give a plug for our what we think of as the usual, uh, the historically usual uh, prospective student day, the in-person version, which will be happening November 5th uh, from nine to three. It'll have a lot of the same elements as this one, plus some additional ones in terms of more opportunity to chat with individual faculty and students, uh, to have a tour of campus, actually get some food, which is sort of hard to do uh, on Zoom. And uh, we'd love to have you there for that event. Also some uh, faculty and student research presentations. Okay. Next slide, please, Kelly. Okay, back there we go. So to introduce ourselves, um, Michigan Biostatistics is without question one of the top biostatistics programs in the world. We're at, at the University of Michigan, one of the top public universities in the United States. And I, I've got to say in the town of Ann Arbor, we're in the, one of the nicest college towns anywhere. It's a great place to live, a great place to be a student, a great place to, 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 to be anything. We also have a department that shows a caring and collegial and collaborative environment. Um, with deep commitments to research, training, and diversity. Next slide, please. So it's fair to ask, what is biostatistics or what do biostatisticians do? Um, and it's impossible, obviously, to summarize that in, in, in a few lines, but, but here's my go at it. Um, biostatisticians develop statistical designs and methods and computational tools for the analysis of biomedical data. We apply these tools to answer questions in medicine, biology, and public health. Um, and for those of you with a strong math background or strong computing background or strong interest in biology but like math, uh, biostatistics is a great field, a great opportunity to combine your interests into a discipline where you can have true impact in, 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 in society. Just a few examples of the, some of the many things biostatisticians do. We work to understand the basis of human health and disease. We develop new drugs and design, decide whether those drugs work. Maybe we don't develop them ourselves, but we have an important role in deciding whether they work and should be used. 
and we predict how long a person with a particular illness might survive. Next slide. In my own case, my work is in the area of statistical genetics. I develop designs and methods and tools, just like the other ones I said, uh, to analyze human genetic data and to apply these to understand the genetic basis of human health and disease, recognizing that that's only a small part of the picture, but an important part. Um, my scientific work focuses on diabetes, type two diabetes, and related traits like obesity and glucose and lipid levels. Um, and I and my close collaborators have identified thousands of genetic variants across the genome uh, that in confer risk to type two diabetes or at least associated with risk to type two diabetes and with levels of these diabetes related traits. I also direct our Michigan Center for Statistical Genetics and Genome Science Training Program. And so if you're interested in genetics, um, I'd be more than happy to chat with you later on uh, this evening or to drop me a line and I'd be happy to do that. I'm also very focused on training students in that area. Next slide, please. So we have a lot of students. This year, we have 276 students from all around the world. Uh, you can see, or maybe I hope you can see the, 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 the map and the, and the numbers. Um, showing the different countries from which our students stem. It's possible we've missed a couple, but I think that's just about everybody. And uh, you can see we have a lot of people from US, a lot of people from China. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. And this is almost everybody. <laughs> and, and obviously when you have 276, you don't get a, a very detailed view, but, but you can see we're quite a, quite a varied group. Our faculty are also quite diverse. We have four and some primary faculty um, and more than 60 uh, total faculty, including joint appointees. Um, and the faculty are pretty diverse too, coming from a, a, a range of countries that you can see down there below. Next slide. And we're all here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Ann Arbor is a town of about 120,000 people. The university is about 50,000 students. Some subset of those 50,000 count in the 120. So we're probably on the order of 150,000 altogether. Um, for a small town, it has remarkable amenities. It has all the small town dis I'm sorry, advantages of being safe and comfortable, uh, easy to nav navigate, and a lot of big city amenities like wonderful music, wonderful sports, um, and our own international airport less than half an hour away, which is actually quite important to me in my lifestyle. Next slide. Um, at Michigan Biostatistics, we have a multifold mission. Um, we work hard to provide high quality training to the next generation of biostatisticians, to enhance diversity, equity, and inclusion in the data science workforce, to carry out impactful biostatistics methods research, and to bring biostatistics design and analysis expertise to a wide spectrum of health related issues. Our ultimate goal is to use data to improve public health. It's as simple as that. Next slide. Um, there are a variety of things that are nice uh, about being in our department, other than the fact that we're nice people and do good stuff. Um, we have, have a great computing infrastructure. We have a nice uh, biostatistics computing cluster for large computational jobs, and we have people who support you in, in using that cluster. We also have uh, uh, someone who supports package development, statistical package development, and that's quite important because when you develop new methods in biostatistics, which is what PhD students definitely do, um, it's really important to, to have the tools to go along with those methods so people will use your new methods and so your methods will have impact. And so um, um, Dan Barker supports our cluster, Mike Kleinsasser supports our package development. Next slide. And this just gives a listing. We have about 180 um, software packages available on a common shared biostatistics software page. Next slide. We also care a great deal uh, about our students' health, uh, both physical and mental. Um, uh, Chidima uh, Comer is a social worker uh, on our uh, student services staff who provides dedicated support for students experiencing challenges during graduate studies. The graduate study, graduate school is a lot of fun, but it's a lot of work and challenges do arise. Um, she also works to enhance and improve the student experience generally and to create events and activities that support wellness and a multicultural community. Next slide. We have a lot of activities in the department. Obviously we have classes, obviously we do research. We're very active in, in student and faculty mentoring. Uh, and so as a student in our department, you'll have at least one faculty mentor 
You'll also uh, have a student mentor, a more senior student who's been here longer and will be there, both of them, to help you adjust to the place, to talk about classes, to talk about living in Ann Arbor and all the different things that matter as you're, as you're coming to a new place. We have a very strong focus on diversity, equity, inclusion amongst the faculty, the staff, and the students. Um, we have a seminar series that has wonderful people coming in, um, uh, typically once a week or every couple of weeks. Um, we have journal clubs, we have working groups, um, and a really fun thing we do is journey lectures where faculty and sometimes students sort of talk about their career paths. We also have parties and lunches and, and all sorts of different activities. And, you know, believe me, I don't think you should pick a graduate program because they have parties and lunches. But if they don't, that's probably not a good sign uh, because you want to be in a place where people are not just working together, but also playing together and becoming colleagues and, and, and enjoying each other. Because honestly, one of the functions of graduate school is to build a cohort that will be with you, likely for your next 30 or 40 years as you go forward in the field. Next slide. Um, we also have a very active student body. It's, it's really fun. And, and the students organize a graduate student seminar, journal clubs, brown bag seminars. Brown bag seminars have lunch associated with them, which is always good for student activities uh, or faculty activities for that matter. Um, and these often focus on bringing in people from companies who can talk about what it's like to work in their companies or talk about different kinds of professional development activities, really worthwhile. There's also a biostatistics student association that um, uh, is sort of a, a social group within the department and encourages socialization, different activities. There's the peer mentoring committee, which is in, in charge of uh, 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 helping assign the student mentors for the, uh, the incoming students and who also periodically provide advice to the faculty, incredibly valuable advice to help us make what we believe is a strong program even stronger. Um, STATCOM uh, is a uh, statistical consulting service, pro bono statistical consulting service run by our students. Another wonderful thing. And just as we have faculty and staff, uh, DEI committees, the students have one as well. And those committees interact actively. Next slide. Um, for those of you who are not seniors, if you're a sophomore or a, or a freshman uh, or, a, or a junior, we have a, a summer program, a six-week summer program we call the Big Data Summer Institute. This is a wonderful program where you will come sort of take classes in the morning and do research projects in the afternoon. It's been incredibly popular. And um, if you are not too far along in your, your program and interested in doing some summer research, I'd encourage you to, uh, to take a look at that as an opportunity. Next slide. So, so this is a quotation from our Dean, Du Bois Bowman, who is actually an alum uh, of our department. He got his master's here. I, I recruited him to the department a long time ago um, and is now our dean and a member of our faculty, um, referring to what we believe as people in a school of public health, given the kind of work we do and the kind of impact we'd like to have. We believe in compassion. Our work is born from compassion, leading to knowledge and research and action. We believe in innovation through creative problem solving, innovative thinking, we lay the groundwork for a healthier world. We believe in inclusion. We work with diverse talents across campus and across the world to bring more ideas and we partner to create lasting solutions. And we pursue impact. The ultimate goal of our work is to create positive change and have a lasting effect on the health of the world. Next slide. Um, and so I'll stop there and say, I hope very much some of you decide to join us and um, uh, time for questions. Uh, hello, uh, I have a question. Hi, Michelle, please. Hi, nice to meet you all. Um, so I'm a senior right now in college, uh, planning to apply this cycle. And I was wondering if there's uh, any way to find out which faculty are taking on new graduate students? Should I reach out to faculty to ask that question or just kind of look at their websites and just kind of see who I'm interested in? It's probably, uh, it's probably best to first look at the websites and you'll see right off, we have a lot of faculty um, and it's a little bit unpredictable who's gonna be taking on students in a given year because it partly depends on who graduates 
Um, you know, with a master's program, it's pretty clear it's going to be done in four semesters. PhD, it's a little bit less predictable because it involves original research and you don't know exactly how long it's going to take. You also don't know exactly what grants are going to get funded. But, you know, typically faculty are taking on students. And if it's important to you in terms of making a decision about whether you want to consider our program or not, I think it's perfectly reasonable to send an email to a faculty or two. Um, asking if they're expecting to, recognizing that they may not be able to give you a definitive answer, but I'm sure they'd try. Yeah. It's also important to note that our admissions are at the departmental level. They're not at the specific faculty member level, so they can't actually grant you admission if they're taking students. So we do that at the faculty level. And even if you don't have a graduate student research position with a specific faculty member, you can approach them and ask them to work on the, your dissertation with them. Um, and most faculty are, are open to working with students across time on their dissertation. So if they're not necessarily, if they don't necessarily have funding this year, it doesn't mean they couldn't fund you in subsequent years, and it doesn't mean that they can't work with you on your dissertation. Yeah, and one more follow up on that. We often have two faculty advisors for students. It's a model I particularly enjoy because it's, it's fun from my perspective to have active collaboration with both students and faculty. And so that's another thing to consider. Uh, Chin Yun, you're raising your hand. Uh, yeah, hello. I have a question uh, that's similar to the previous one. So when I, uh, when I log in the portal, it asked me to fill in three like professors that I want to work in with or interested with. So does that have some effect on what faculty will I be assigned to? Um, probably not a lot. Um, we're basically trying to get information to see who's interested. Um, if, you, if you don't know of any faculty that you're particularly interested in working with, it's fine to leave that blank. Um, if there are particular areas and particular faculty you'd really like to work with, include the information. It's useful to us, but it's not going to make a lot of difference, maybe no difference in terms of whether you're admitted to the program or not. Um, once you're admitted to the program and once um, uh, we've decided if we're going to offer you funding, then there'll be an active discourse between you and the admissions committee and the prospective faculty to, to do a match uh, in terms of with whom you'd work. But um, um, you know, initially, that's you know, just to give us a better idea of you and what you're interested. But as I say, there's no need to specify faculty. Um, uh, but if, if, if there are particular people you're interested in, please do. Pablo. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Pablo. I have a BS in physics and I'm doing a master's in math. Uh, but I, I so I'm, I'm planning on, on applying this, uh, this cycle. Great. Uh, but I can't say that I have um, a very meaningful research experience. And so I'm just wondering, like, how much weight do you put on the uh, research experience? So if you have it, um, we'd love to see it. If you don't, that's fine, too. Um, what we're really looking for is, do we believe that biostatistics will be a good fit for you, that our department will be helpful for you, um, and that you'll be fun for us to have here in the sense of contributing in a meaningful way to our, 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 our cohort and our, our graduate program. Um, so as with all things, I think, when it comes to, to graduate school applications, um, emphasize the things that you think are relevant. And you know, if you don't have research experience, just you know, you can say that, or just talk about the other things you have done that you think might be relevant and important. Yeah. And Kelly will be talking more about admissions and things next. I was just going to say that's a great segue into the slides I'm going to share with you and the topics I'll talk about. So thank you so much, Mike. And Mike will be here for the rest to help us answer questions. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about. Um, the programs, admissions, and financial support uh, as the admissions committee chair. So Mike already uh, introduced biostatistics to you um, and the greatness of University of Michigan, but just to really, you know, make sure that you're not leaving here without knowing it, we're one of the best departments in the world. All of our PhD students are fully funded. Some of our master's students are funded. And when I say funded, that means that um, your time at the University of Michigan is uh, paid for. So your tuition is paid for, you receive a stipend, um, and you're, you receive benefits in terms of health insurance. All of our graduates obtain really interesting and well-paying jobs. Our master's program 
um, is incredibly rigorous and wonderful and our master's students get wonderful jobs as do the PhD. And it's really just an extremely exciting field to be working in that I think many more people are now aware of because of the pandemic, but there's so much more that we as biostatisticians can do. And we have such a great breadth and variety of um, faculty in our department that work across so many different fields. So it's just a wonderful place to come. If you know what you wanna do, there's somebody here who does it. And if you don't know what you wanna do, you'll find someone here who does it. Um, so it's really just a great department for that. As Mike said, we have 276 students. These are all residential students. So we do not have um, on an online program or online students. Um, that's 171 master's students and 105 PhD students. We have 41 faculty, over 2,000 alumni and amazing jobs and that can help um, with connections in your career placement, internships, et cetera. And um, we have excellent research funding, so over 38 million in annual research funds. We are part of the School of Public Health in the University of Michigan, which has um, several other departments, including environmental health, epidemiology, health behavioral health education, health management and policy, and nutrition. Uh, so we're one of those departments in the School of Public Health, which spans two buildings um, at the University of Michigan. So on to the good stuff and probably a lot of why you came here to hear about the application. And then, well, I know you're really here to hear the students talk, but um, we'll go through this, this part first. So your application um, is uh, very important and we base our admission, at, it's a holistic review. Um, and what we're looking at is your math background, your GPA overall and math based. You have three letters of recommendation that we're really looking to be um, mostly academic letters and or research letters and your statement of purpose. And there's also a personal statement involved as well. So you have two pieces of writing um, that we're looking at. Our prerequisites for the master's and the PhD are that you have multivariable calculus or three semesters worth of calculus, linear algebra, and an introductory statistics course. So note that there's no biology required here. There's no computational course. Um, uh, we, would, we assume that you're gonna learn that in our program. For the PhD, um, it's nice if you also have advanced calculus. Also, many of our PhD students have already obtained their master's. However, you do not have to have a master's degree to apply to our PhD program. Um, so it's helpful if you have other mathematics courses, advanced calculus, other statistics courses or programming, but we're really just making sure that you have those three prereq classes in your application. So I have a few application tips for you. Um, the first is that it's really great if you can be specific in your personal, in your statement of purpose about why biostatistics interests you and specifically why the University of Michigan Department of Biostatistics interests you. Um, so hopefully at least in a couple sentences or there's a little paragraph that maybe you change for each application, but you really make it personal for each school to point out who it is maybe you want to work with or what area you want to work in or what makes you excited about that place. Um, we're interested in knowing about your background and your current and future goals and your specific interests. And that helps, you know, kind of coalesce that in that meaning of why biostatistics is interesting to you or why it might be your passion or what you're interested in pursuing. It's helpful when you write clearly and when you write well. And so in order to do that, it's a good idea to get started early on those statements and that personal statement to have others read it and give you feedback on it. Um, so you don't have to ask a statistics professor or someone who knows mathematics to read it. Ask your mom, ask your brother, ask a friend, your roommate. Um, just get somebody to read it and say, oh yeah, I get that, it, and that makes sense. Um, also, please contact your letter writers early as well. So if you haven't, if you're applying this year, oh, and you haven't contacted them already, um, please contact your letter writers and um, ask them if they're available to write the letters for you. We really wanna know about your math skills, your statistics, your computing and your research. Um, and so, you know, help them 
know more about you if they don't know more about you already. If you've had any uh, blemishes in your record, maybe it was really tough at first or something happened, you had to take some time off, um, it's probably it's pretty useful to actually address those and to explain them. You don't have to go into great detail, but to just say, you know, this is what happened, but this is how things are different now and or this is how I've grown from this experience. Um, and then a lot of people say, okay, so what's the most important part of the application? Well, I don't have a good answer for that. It's all important. Like I said, this is a holistic review. Um, and so we're really interested in looking at you as a full person, your math background, but also just, you know, what it is that you've done and what you want to do with it. Um, and so putting together a nice full package is, is re really what we're looking for. So I can tell you about last year's admissions, which we think is likely to be similar as we move forward. And um, we had 759 applications. We had 759 applications of which the majority of those were uh, masters of public health or masters in science applications. Um, 256 of those were to the PhD. We um, this year matriculated 89 master students and 19 PhD students. Now those students have various backgrounds. The primary background is um, coming from math or biostatistics, but there are also people coming from lots of other backgrounds too. So um, we do require those three kind of math stat prereqs. But otherwise, you know, if you have a biology or chemistry background or business or, or economics, engineering, physics, computer science, we're very much interested in you as well. Um, you have those great critical thinking skills, interest in science. Um, and so as long as you have those prereqs, you're more than welcome to apply. Um, all of our PhD incoming students did have a um, math or biostatistics background. So like I said, we have a pretty large faculty um, who have this wide range of research areas. We have world renowned experts in so many areas, including big data, statistical genetics and genomics, imaging, survival data, longitudinal data, survey methods, missing data, clinical trials, Bayesian methods, infectious diseases, among many, many others. And there's some really great information about these areas, who works in them, and exactly what, what they're doing, some of the things that they're doing on our website. So I encourage you to look more into our website if you're interested. Um, as many biostatisticians, epidemiologists, we're very busy during the pandemic. So are many members of our department. Um, and so there is a, a web page dedicated to all of the work that individuals in our department um, did to contribute to COVID-19 research. Um, individuals were, were involved in clinical trials, in monitoring health risk, in um, modeling disease and predicting the disease risk. Um, and so very interesting, a lot of work that was done and is still being done today. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit more about the specifics of the master's programs and then the PhD program. So we have a master's of science. Actually, we have, for next year, we're gonna have two master's of science programs. I'll delineate those in a minute. Um, we also do offer a master's in public health program. However, we do suggest we, that you apply to our master's in science as opposed to the master's in public health. Um, we just, they're very similar and we primarily use the master's of science degree. So these programs are 48 credit hours. They're essentially two year degrees. Uh, the 36 of those hours are in biostatistics. Three are in epidemiology. There's one hour of public health information of one public health course. And then you can take other courses across the university. So you can take courses in the School of Public Health and you can also take courses just generally across the university in terms of bioinformatics, computer science, statistics, um, whatever it is that, that interests you and is related. 
Um, for the MPH program, it differs from the MS in terms of there is a core curriculum for public health uh, that is added on to our biostatistics curriculum, and there is a mandatory internship. Now, many of our students in the Masters of Science program do obtain internships in the summer, um, and it's just not part technically part of the degree for the Masters of Science. In the Masters program, we're really thinking that we're giving you these skills to be amazing collaborative biostatisticians and to be phenomenal team members. Some of the courses in the master's programs um, are listed here. These, this first set, the 601, 602, 650, 651, 653, and 699, this is the core curriculum that makes up our master's programs. And it's dealing with probability theory, statistical inference, statistical methods in terms of regressions, and it all comes together in our capstone course at the end of your second year of the master's in Biostat 699, which is the analysis of biostatistical investigations. This is where you actually get real data, you analyze it, you're putting all of your knowledge together, you present your data, and it's really preparing you for what you'll do in the workforce. Um, we, as part of the biostatistics credits, um, ask for at least 12 credit hours of biostatistic electives. Those can be things like, um, like uh, clinical trials or survival analysis, other classes that you might be interested in, genetics or genomics or big data, um, computing courses, and then you can take additional electives. So those could be out of the other programs in terms of uh, maybe out of statistics or bioinformatics, computer science, or they could be more biostatistics courses. We've had what is a, bio, a health data science concentration in our master's program for the past few years. And in this next year, we're actually going to offer this as a full master's degree. So when you go to apply to our program, if you're interested in a master's, you can apply for a master's in biostatistics, or you can apply for a master's in health data science. Now this master's in health data science is within the biostatistics department, and you will take several courses together with the master's students in biostatistics, but there's more of a focus on computation, big data, um, and data management than in our primary biostatistics master's program. Um, all of the health data science courses are available to the master's biostatistics master's students, um, but the health data science master's is really going to focus on those big data computation courses um, and make sure that those are uh, what your primary core curriculum is based around. This is really targeted to students who are interested in a terminal master's degree to going out in the workforce as a data scientist after their master's. Now it is possible to apply to PhD programs after this degree as well, um, but we see it as a really phenomenal great degree to start your the work in the work, to start your career in the workforce. So the health data science coursework is very similar to the biostatistics masters. You'll take some of those core courses in terms of our statistical probability classes and theory classes and some of the core regression courses. Um, but then we're gonna fill in many of the other biostatistics classes with this, these specific com computation and machine learning health data science classes. Then we also have our PhD program. This typically takes about three to four years after your master's. If you're coming straight from undergrad, we would assume that you would essentially be taking the two years of our master's program and then hopping into our PhD program. So it could take five to six years. Um, along with the master's curriculum, you would also take advanced calculus, um, and then have an advanced statistical inference series, our 801 and 802 classes. We also require statistic, so stochastic processes um, and then additional biostatistics elective courses. There is a qualifying exam. So after either your first or second year in the program, you would take um, the qualifying exam. Right now, the qualifying exam looks like a theory exam and then an exam of choice of which you can choose an advanced theory exam, an applied exam, or a computational exam. Um, that 
is what we did last year. It's what we're doing this year. It's likely what we will do the following year, but sometimes it's it's changing. <laughs> um, but that's really just to show you that all those things that you learn to put them all together, um, to show you what you've learned and how it's used and just get you prepared for the research ahead and the PhD. We really wanna support you. We want you to do well. We want you to pass those. We're not trying to weed anyone out. Um, so it's a very collaborative, environment of students studying and um, advisors helping to prepare their students. The culminating experience of the PhD is the dissertation. So you start working on your thesis um, once most of your coursework is complete. And um, we primarily have a three chapter thesis or dissertation, um, which may be related or perhaps loosely related. Um, developing new statistical theory in some area. In the PhD program, we're really helping you to not only be a wonderful collaborative biostatistician, but also helping to provide you with leadership skills so that you could be a team leader um, and pursue continued research in some fashion. So over this past year, 104 of our students were supported via graduate student research assistantships so those are um, where students are essentially working as apprentices at, on research projects with faculty members. Um, this is where your tuition and your stipend and your benefits are coming from working around 20 hours per week on research projects. 23 of our students were funded via graduate student instructorships, which are like teaching assistantships or TA positions. Um, these are, since we don't have an undergrad program, these are primarily our service courses for the other school public health disciplines that take st intro statistics courses. 16 of our students were um, funded via fellowships. So these are through the genome science training program, which Mike mentioned in the beginning. We also have a training grant program from cancer, uh, cancer biostatistics. Um, we have a few other fellowships there that are from the University of Michigan, like the Regents Fellowship, Rackham Merit Fellowship, um, and some other ones. And so fellows are supported to take their courses and to do research, um, but don't necessarily have the, they don't have the teaching that GSIs do and are somewhat delineated from the graduate student research assistantships. Um, many of our, 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 at least 15 of our master's students while not fully funded, received tuition um, awards. And so at, at least a quarter, if not a half of their tuition were provi was provided um, by our, our department. So uh, while we can't offer full funding for many in the master's level, we do have wonderful scholarships to help with the tuition payments. A little bit more about the training grants or the fellowships. So we have this genome science training program, which Mike um, mentioned. This is an NIH funded training grant. And um, this is where biostatistics, computation, and genetics all come together. It's a world leading program in its 28th year. So an extremely successful um, and, and well run, uh, you know, smoothly run program throughout many years and just a phenomenal, phenomenal program. This supports 13 pre-doctoral trainees. And as part of this, it's actually 49 faculty across nine departments. Um, 11 of those are in biostatistics. And the ideal background for someone who's interested in this genome science training program is that you've had a math major and a biology minor or vice versa. The program features are, uh, you can potentially start early, so you could start the summer before you, um, before classes begin. There's a seminar series, a journal club, orientation, annual retreat, funding to attend meetings, and extensive mentoring and tutoring offered. If you are interested in this program, um, you would want to mention it in your statement of purpose, and we can make sure that individuals from, um, like Mike, can reach out to you and chat to, uh, to you about this program and make sure that you can get in the right uh, materials to actually be considered for this fellowship. We also have a cancer biostatistics training program. And so um, this is for 
students who might be really interested in cancer research. This supports four PhD or PhD bound students that's funded by the NIH. Um, our, the PI of the Cancer Biostatistics Training Program is Jeremy Taylor, faculty in our department, um, but 12 biostatistics faculty are involved in this training program. So there's biostatistics specific cancer research coursework, there's expanded cancer-based cognates or elective courses, there's a seminar, there's research assistant experience, a journal club, and funding to attend meetings. Um, this training grant and the faculty who are involved in it from biostatistics have very strong links with the University of Michigan Comprehensive Cancer Center. The best background for students interested in this are those coming from a mathematics or statistics major who are interested in science more specifically in cancer research. Um, if you're interested in this one, I also recommend that you put something about that in your statement of purpose um, and potentially reach out to Jeremy Taylor who can talk to you in more detail about this training program. I won't spend too much time on this because I know the students will also introduce STATCOM and Mike said us, uh, uh, explained it earlier, but this is just a wonderful community outreach program that um, is really run by students, has won awards, and is a phenomenal opportunity for students who are interested in some applied research, really outreaching to the community. So doing good with the statistics work that they're doing. Our graduates find phenomenal opportunities um, for many, many reasons. One, the department has a phenomenal reputation. Um, biostatistics is such an important and in-demand field. And we provide such a great rigorous statistical training background um, that individuals looking for, for um, looking to hire students know that they're gonna find really talented students from University of Michigan. Um, our students are placed in positions in universities, in research centers, in government, in industry, pharma, and biotech, um, all across many, many companies um, and many different areas. The department posts notices of positions. So often faculty will send out, oh, there's positions here. Um, we also post recruiters. So for example, on Friday this week, Eli Lilly is coming to talk to our students. Um, we have a phenomenal career services program uh, who is helping in terms of getting our students connected. We also have um, really great connections with our alumni and we're building those all the time. We have alumni spotlights where students can connect with our alumni. And we've also just started a professional development course in which we're really helping students um, get together their material for applying to internships and jobs, which is really putting our students um, in better position and providing more active mentoring in this area. So here are some examples of companies and places, universities, research hospitals, um, et cetera, in which some of our recent graduates have found work. You can see that it spans from pharma pharmaceutical companies to government agencies to financial um, consulting groups, really just so many opportunities across the board. And those are just some of them. Um, we're still getting some questions about how COVID-19 is impacting our program. And so just, you know, things are always changing, but this year, uh, pretty much everything is in person. So uh, all of our students were, we were expecting to see in Ann Arbor, Almost all of our classes in, are in person. There are very few which are virtual. Um, one thing that did change with um, COVID and with many other uh, things that and discussions that have occurred is that we are no longer accepting the GREs. Um, they're not considered in the admissions process. And in fact, I don't think even if you want to submit them that we will see them. Um, and so I, I do not recommend taking them for our admission purposes. We are having more virtual events. So we have this event, for example, that we didn't have prior to COVID-19. And as Mike said, we'll continue to do this because we get to connect with many more of you um, than we could when we only had our in-person event. But we do also have our in-person event on November 5th, and we'd love to see you there as well. So some key dates that are very important. If you don't have these in your calendar, please get them in there. 
if you're applying for this year, the application deadline is December 1st. So that's for all applications, all masters and PhD applications. Our admissions and funding decisions happen generally around mid-February. And then you have until April 15th to make your decision. If you know that you're coming to Michigan, please tell us as soon as you can. We'd love to hear from you and congratulate you and get excited to see you in the fall. Um, once you've committed and all of the students have committed, uh, we send out a matching form to the funded students, the students who have been promised funding to get some more information about what you're interested in. Would you prefer a graduate student research position or a teaching position? Um, who are you interested in working with and what areas, et cetera? And then we do our best to make those matches. Um, you find out those matches at the latest in August before you come to campus. And then in late August, we have um, a week or a few days of orientation to help you uh, get acquainted with Ann Arbor and the Department of Biostatistics and fill your backpack with lots of Michigan swag. So if you're interested in more, um, you're more than welcome to email any of these people that you see on this slide. So Nicole Fennick, who isn't talking but is incredibly important along with Fatma, um, they're incredibly important to us in this whole process. If we don't know the answer, or even if we do, we might send you to Nicole or Fatma. They're a great place to start for your questions. Um, if you have additional questions or want to talk to me about research, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email is here as well. We have a wonderful Frequently Asked Questions page on our, um, on our website. I encourage you to go find that and to look and see if your question exists on there. Um, and just to peruse our website as, with lots of information. So I think that um, we will go to the, oh yes, and Alicia just reminded us that there are also um, school public health ambassadors specific to the biostatistics department that you can reach out to and have their information on the website as well. And if you're interested in connecting to a student, you can also reach out to Nicole Fatma or myself and we can get you um, in touch with a student to, to email or to Zoom with. So we'll, I'll hand it over to the students now, and I think we'll open up for discussion after that. So Shumik, are you on? Are you sharing the? Yeah, I'm on. Um, I will be, so uh, yeah, I do have some slides. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. All right. Um, is my screen visible? Yes, perfect. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, all right, um, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Shomek. I'm a fourth year PhD student in the Biostat department. I've been here since 2019. Um, and today we'll be talking, so we'll be talking as a group, we'll be talking about um, our perspective as students in terms of what it's like to be a graduate student here um, in the department of biostatistics. Um, now, um, pursuing a graduate degree has its own sets of unique challenges and rewards. So today we'll be presenting our perspective on what it's like to be a graduate student here. Um, I don't intend for this to be a long presentation, but if you want the elevator pitch, um, I love it here. I hope you love it here as well if you do choose to come to graduate school here. Um, personally, I could not have asked for a better graduate school experience. Um, the intent of these slides are to provide relevant information on a range of topics that um, prospective students usually have um, regarding our time here at Michigan. Um, hopefully it will help you as well in terms of finding assistance if you need it. Um, it could be something like connections um, to graduate student groups, or it could be tips on surviving um, the cold weather out here. Um, it could also include resources on personal well-being. Um, and I'm glad to report that I have had a great deal of support both from the department and also the university at large with regards to all of these headings. Um, but before I move ahead, I just wanted to, um, I just wanted all of you to meet our wonderful panel of graduate students who have decided to, who have agreed to share their experience, experiences with you. Um, maybe we can go around and start introducing ourselves. Um, I will pick, um, Daniela, do you wanna start? Yes, um, hi everyone, my name is Daniela. Um, I'm a second year master's student. I'm from Colombia and I'm very happy to be with all. Um, Alicia, do you want to go next? 
you cut out like for the last five seconds if you want to repeat real quickly oh I'm so sorry <laughs> um I was just saying that I'm very happy to be with all of you and like any question that you may have um Alicia thank you Daniela um my name is Alicia Dominguez. Um, this is my fifth year in the department. I'm currently a PhD student, um, but I did my master's here. Um, I'm originally from New Mexico and did my undergrad at the University of New Mexico. And I'm pretty involved in the department and like different student groups, um, but I also do research in statistical genetics with Sebastian Zollner and I've been on the genome science training program. So feel free to ask me questions about any of that stuff. Elizabeth, would you like to go next, please? Sure, yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Chase. Uh, I am in the sixth year of my PhD here. I came straight from undergrad. Um, I work with Drs. Jeremy Taylor and Phil Boonstra. I'm originally from Fredericksburg, Virginia, but I did my undergrad at UNC. Um, I don't know if there are any other Tar Heels on the call. Uh, and I was also on the cancer training grant for a while, so I can speak a little bit to that. And also, I guess, outside funding as a PhD student. So, thanks. Uh, I can go next. Uh, so I'm Sam Fansler. Uh, I'm a second year MS student. Uh, I'm originally from Illinois and I did my undergrad uh, at Butler University in Indiana. So uh, I know all about the Midwest and the weather here if you have any questions about living in the Midwest. Um, and yeah, I'm super excited to meet all of you. Uh, Abby, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, I'm Abby. I went to Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota, so I have the distinction of what, being one of the few people who actually had to move south to come to Ann Arbor. Um, I am happy to talk about winter. My best advice is get a warm coat. You'll be fine. Um, but any other questions you have, I'm happy to answer them. Oh, sorry. Also, I do survival analysis research with Jenka Wu. Um, and Sarah, I think you're up. Okay, thanks, Abby. I'm Sarah. I am a second year master's student, and I am very lucky to uh, work on some research with Kelly. Um, I'm from Michigan, so I beat out Sam there. I'm even more local. And yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Very happy to share my experience. And then I think we have uh, Mike last. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Mike. Sorry, my name is Mike. Um, I'm a second year graduate student. Um, I am accepted to the PhD program. Um, I'm originally from Long Island, New York. Um, my bachelor's degree is in applied math and computer science from Stony Brook University. Um, I'm a current trainee of the genome science training program. I'm also a first generation college student. So if you have any questions about anything, um, feel free to ask me and I'm happy to share my experience. Perfect, thanks, Mike. Um... And hi, everyone. I've already introduced myself. My name is Shomik. I'm from India. I've been here for four years. So I'll hopefully be out pretty soon. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about the department and also answer any questions you have. But before that, there are some pieces of information which I think might be useful um, to anyone who's considering going to grad school here. Um, so let's start with that first. So um, first off, if you do sign up, so um, on your screen here, um, if you start at the bottom right corner of your screens, that's the School of Public Health. Um, the Department of Biostatistics is on the fourth floor of this building. Um, this is probably from sometime in summer because you don't really see too many students in this frame. Um, you will have way more students crowding up your frame in case you want to take photos. You probably have to be super early or wait until all of the classes are over. Um, on the bottom left of your screens, that's Barton Tower. Um, next to it is Hill Auditorium, absolutely beautiful acoustics. Um, and in the right, you'll see my cursor circling Rackham. So that's the school graduate school. So all of your applications are directed to Rackham. And this is, um, I was, I was um, at dinner at a restaurant right next to the Michigan Theater here just before um, I joined this call. So my point of um, keeping these on this slide is to, make, um, is to make the point that if you do sign up to come to school here at Michigan Biostatistics, you're not just a graduate student in the Department of Biostatistics, you're also part of a vibrant community, which is the School of Public Health. Um, I checked with Nicole a little earlier today, we're about 1,200 graduate students strong. Um, not only that, we're also one of the best public universities um, in the country 
Ann Arbor has consistently been ranked as one of the best places to live in the United States. Um, so the community of the School of Public Health, the universe, the larger university, and of course Ann Arbor, they overlap and intersect, and they will definitely play a strong role in shaping your lives as you decide to come to graduate school here. Um, I love it here. Um, and the purpose of this slide is to sort of give you a structure of how um, we're thinking about this uh, specific presentation. So first we'll be talking about some departmental resources, then we'll move on to resources that the School of Public Health offers, and finally resources you can find at the university level and also stuff you can do here in Ann Arbor. Um, so here are some um, descriptive statistics. Um, no biostat seminar is complete without them. So as of 2022, um, we have 276 students, 124 staff members, and fa 41 faculty members. So um, that brings um, the department-wide um, student to faculty ratio at about seven. Um, the student to faculty ratio in the School of Public Health is about nine and the university-wide ratio is about 14. Um, we have a very supportive administrative staff as well. Um, and I think the key point of having such a large department is that there's always support regardless of what kind of help you are looking for, if you are willing to reach out for it. Um, and on the right side of your screens, you'll see the major areas which are um, influencing our lives here in the department. Um, I don't mean to claim this is an exhaustive list at all. Um, as is the case with grad school, the program is exciting and it's always a challenging process. Um, there's academic support in terms of study groups and library resources. Um, as Kelly was mentioning before, there's a um, a lot of students dread taking the qualifying exams. I think one question that was fairly frequent in terms of the questions that you, the participants, sent in was how hard are the calls and whether people fail in it or not. The point of the calls is not to fail anyone, of course. Um, and the best part about calls is probably the study groups. I have great memories of um, sharing the same study group as I think Alicia is on this call. Yeah, so we were in the same study group um, and we had great fun studying for the calls um, back in 2020. Um, so I think from that perspective, we have um, support from the library staff as well. Um, literature review is a big component of a lot of the research that we do, and we have great um, resources from the library members as well. Um, the department is great in terms of providing sources of support for um, well-being. We're really fortunate to have Chidima. I don't think Chidima is on this call, but um, she's been a great resource. She helps with personal guidance and wellness. Um, in addition, both the School of Public Health as well as the university have embedded well-being resources as well as crisis support. I'll be coming to those points in a few slides. Um, my personal favorite as a computer nerd is the computer support we get here um, in the department. Um, we have amazing computing resources um, led by Dan and Mike. Um, the department has its own high performance computing cluster as well as um, regular workshops for students to brush up on their programming skills because we have students from a wide variety of disciplines coming to grad school here at U of M Biostatistics. Not everyone is on the same level of coding. I certainly was a fairly poor coder when I joined the program, but I feel with the help that the department has, my skills have improved. Um, a lot of work that we do is um, focused on building R packages or Python packages, and there's a lot of support for that as well. Um, there's also a great deal of community engagement. As Kelly mentioned, STATCOM is a community research program that offers the expertise of graduate students um, completely free of charge to nonprofit, governmental, and or community organizations in the area of data science. Um, I think on this call, Abby, Alicia, and Daniela, and I are part of STATCOM. This is probably the largest representation of STATCOM I've seen at a prospective student day. Um, so go STATCOM. Um, I'm, I'm personally really proud of the organization. We also have the Biostat student organization, which Alicia is also a part of. Um, the, the BSA organizes fun social events and provides um, a forum for students to talk to each other and get to know each other better outside of classrooms. And it's always great fun. Um, I'm not sure if we've done the last happy hour of this season yet, but um, happy hours organized by BSA are usually um, a great event that all of us look forward to. Um, there is a new professional development seminar um, last year, up until the last year, we had this seminar, which was primarily organized by students called the Brown Bag Seminar, but now um, the department has taken a greater role in organizing these seminars, which are primarily aimed at professional development for masters as well as PhD students. Um, in addition to that, we also have the Alumni of the Month series, which is also a new addition 
to the seminars that the department organizes. Um, I think the really cool part about the alumni of month seminar is that you get to see people who are who have gone through the same process that you're going through. And you can look at people visiting and speaking at the seminar and say, hey, that could be me one day. And I think having role models is a very critical component when you're um, in grad school. And finally, we have, um, we have a great deal of student representation and departmental committees. So you'll see all of those um, on your screen. Um, almost all of the committees that the department has in terms of administration and um, student welfare, all of them have student feedback. Student feedback is solicited whenever possible. The peer mentoring committee in particular provides support and resources for students by connecting mentees to mentors. So anytime, if any of you decide to come to grad school here, one component of your onboarding process, so to speak, would be for the peer mentoring committee to connect you to, to a mentor. Um, and as mentee, you can ask them about potential questions you have regarding the move to Ann Arbor, the department in general, or anything really. Um, and I think I've, I've gone through the process myself and having someone to talk to who's going through or has gone through a similar process is something that I really appreciated. Um, and finally, we have a very active calendar of events as far as seminars and workshops are concerned. We have weekly seminars on Thursday. Um, we also have graduate student seminars where just graduate students discuss their work. Um, we know that it can be daunting to talk about your work in front of faculty members. So um, unless they are specifically invited by the speaker, um, no faculty members usually attend the graduate student working group. So you can afford to be a little careless with the way you word your research statement. Your math could be a little wrong as long as you have the idea. Um, I think it's a great place to talk to your peers about the ideas that you've been exploring. Um, and finally, we have faculty lunches. Um, COVID did sort of push a pause button on those, but I'm really happy to see that the department has started them again. Um, and so every now and then we were sent out emails in terms of you should sign up for so-and-so faculty lunch. Um, those Excel sheets are filled up super fast. So you have to be really active on your emails. Um, and finally, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight that these are the ones in red are the ones where you get free food. Um, as graduate student, that's a fairly big part of your um, life in the department. So next we look at um, some SPH resources. Um, there are many research initiatives um, spanning across multiple departments and disciplines. Um, one question that some of you asked was whether the School of when the, the Department of Biostat has a good presence in the School of Public Health and whether it's interdisciplinary or not. Um, the question is yes, in, it's a resounding yes in capitals. Um, and it's, I think the Biostat department is very uniquely positioned because you get to talk to people from the statistics department, from the engineering department, from the med school. So, um, and the culture in this department really sort of supports collaborative research. Um, and I would go so far as to claim that collaborative research, um, if you do have an opportunity, is a very critical part of Michigan, of the Michigan Biostatistics Training Program. Um, there's a host of student organizations. The Public Health Student Assembly is one of them. Um, I'm not sure if you can click on this slide, but I do have um, links attached to this um, slide. I'm, I hope I can share them once this presentation is over, or if not, I can certainly send out the email links. Um, and then there's also this very cool thing called the School of Public Health Writing Lab and the separate thing called the School of Public Health Career Center. The Writing Lab is one of my personal favorites. Um, I, as a non-native speaker, I have a lot of trouble writing science in a con concise and coherent way. Um, so the School of Public Health Writing Lab has been instrumental in helping me improve my own writing skills. Um, and it's not just me. I think if you do take the Capstone 699 course, at some point or another, you're probably going to have to um, consider going to the Writing Lab. Um, and pretty much everyone else who I've spoken to who has had an opportunity to go to the Writing Lab have claimed that it really helps their writing experience. Um, the other really important useful resource is the Public Health Careers Office. Um, one major aim the office has is being able to focus on bridging the gap between our training in schools and our professional aspirations. The Career Center provides information on postings like jobs, internships, and fellowships, and also organizes workshops. In addition to workshops, you can have 
one-on-one -on -one appointments where you can talk about maybe um, having a well-rounded job search approach. You could have um, feedback on how well or how professional your CV looks and so on and so forth, or maybe even your cover letter. Um, the Career Center also helps with negotiating a salary once you've landed the job you're looking for. Um, and there's really a lot more. Um, it's not fair for me to say that this is an exclusive or exhaustive list at all. Um, I, I wish I had more time to talk in more detail about all of these, but honestly, there's a wealth of resources that all of us have great access to. So we've spoken about the Department of Biostatistics, we've moved to the larger School of Public Health, and finally, we're at the university level. Um, U of M is one of the best public universities in the United States. Um, it's going to take a really long time to really list all of the resources, which I feel are great resources that the university can offer. Um, there are some popular ones, like um, there's a university-wide student wellness program called CAPS. Um, there's a labor union for graduate students and a separate one for lecturers. Um, there's a free legal clinic, should you need it. Um, if you don't know yet, U of M is pretty big on sports. There's a great Penn State game coming up. I think the photo on the slide is from a previous Penn State game. Um, and there's pretty much, um, because we have large gyms and um, there's a lot of intramural sports that um, you could play if you wanted to. Um, so when I say every intramural sport, I really mean every intramural sport. Um, U of M has its own professional Quidditch team. So if you're a Potterhead like I am, um, this was really one of the major <laughs> uh, points of attraction when I was looking at um, U of M in terms of applying to grad school. Um, and finally, there's Ann Arbor. Um, it's an exceptionally pretty town. Um, some of these photos are probably taken by students in the department, if I'm not wrong. Um, and it's, it's a great place to be a graduate student in. It's consistently been rated as a great place to live in. The public school and the library systems are quite good. Um, those are specifically meaningful to me. Um, there's a pretty vibrant nightlife as well. We have great movie theaters, multiple great auditoriums with wonderful acoustics. Um, if you can recognize, this is the same Barton Tower, which we had on slide two, and there's Hill Auditorium right next to it. Um, I remember my first year here in 2019, um, Bob Dylan was touring the Midwest, and that was the first time, only time really, I, I saw Bob Dylan. And um, we had a pretty bad seat because we had student tickets, but it was a really nice experience. The acoustics at Hill are by far the best that I've seen so far. Um, and the summer months here are particularly good. The winter months, not as much. Um, as Abby pointed out, as long as you have a big jacket, you should be good. Um, weather in Ann Arbor is iffy. Um, bring a bed jacket, bring a swimsuit, um, and be prepared for fluctuations. Um, I think that pretty much brings me to an end in terms of information I had. I know that's a lot of information that I've stuffed into a couple of slides. I'm happy to answer any specific questions you had. Um, one general question that a lot of you had was, um, what makes this department unique? And for me, it's really the people. Um, I could not, as I started by, I started this presentation by seeing that I could not have asked for a better graduate school experience. And I really mean that because um, the institute that I come from, about 20 people apply to universities in the US for their graduate program. And I feel that I've definitely um, sort of won the lottery ticket in terms of having a great grad school experience. So really I could not say, I, I, I would be remiss in terms of not saying that U of M has a great, great graduate experience in store for you if you do decide to. Um, commit to the department. So that's it. Thank you. Um, that's SPH again on your screens and go blue. That's great. Thank you so much, Shumik. That was incredibly useful. So I'm we're going to try to spotlight the, the student panel. So maybe if you can. Well, those are great questions, too. Um, I wonder if we want to take down your slides and spotlight the students keep you guys so everybody can see you and then we'll let um students ask questions so for example there's a question here that says how easy is it to go around town without a car i don't have a car so i can talk about that um yeah it's pretty okay i think you need to be strategic in where you choose to live in ann arbor i mean definitely some parts are better than others but i think i deliberately chose an apartment that's 
um, really close to campus and the buses are like free and great here, free for students. Um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say, you know, yeah, I think it's pretty doable. That's great. Sorry, I'm adding spotlights very slowly. If anybody else can add them, <laughs> make sure I'm doing it well. Um, what are the other questions? I was trying to ask a lot of them in the chat. Let's see, two, there's two more of you. Oh, good, Sam, who else? Students, feel free to either speak up, raise your hand. Oh, Michelle. Hi, um, I have a couple questions. Also, thanks for answering the card question. That's great. Yeah, Angel, I also was wondering about that. Um, so my first question is, I'm wondering as graduate students, so I'm interested in the PhD program, but maybe this is like a broad question. How much do you think your research interests are kind of shaped by what you think might get funded? Or like, can you kind of pursue whatever you want to pursue? But then like, if it doesn't get funded, is that is that an issue? And then my second question, which is probably unrelated, but feel free to answer it. Um, for StatCom, I'm wondering, are faculty involved in that? Or is that a student program? And can you work with that like community service statistics um, initiative? Can that like count toward your like graduate studies? I mean, I guess I can answer the first question. I'm working on survival analysis and machine learning problems, neither of which were things that I like said that I was interested in on my application. Um, and I think it's definitely like a nice thing to be exposed to those topics um, through GSRA work. Um, like you're kind of like told this is what your project is, like this is what we wanna know. And then you get this like really broad experience of all of these different topics. Um, that being said, like I'm really interested in causal inference and like social determinants of health. And so having my GSRA advisors, I can ask them, oh, like, could we apply this to chronic illnesses? Could we apply this to longer term diseases um, that might not necessarily be as acute as some of the things that we're looking at? And so you can definitely like shift um, most projects into your own interests. You just have to be a little creative with it. I think there was a question about StatCom as well. Alicia, do you want to answer that one? Do you remember it? It was our faculty involved in StatCom. Um, so I think that we have definitely like faculty on our leadership team that help like guide the students in making decisions. And then for each project, there's one faculty that also like sits in on meetings, right? Show Mick or not even meetings, but like they're kind of like assigned to the project to be the, the support for students. And usually there's one senior student also on each project or a couple of senior students on the project and um, maybe some first years on each of the project. So if we put first years on projects, we don't really expect them to know a lot, but we do expect them to kind of like contribute in thoughts and like maybe they can do some of like the descriptive statistics. And um, it's definitely not like a, alternative to like a GSRA or it's more of like um, just wanting to get more experience learn how to work with others working with real data um, I don't know is there anything you want to add to that Shomik because we've been kind of talking about this yeah no you, you said everything yeah I just Michelle, wanted to add you? really yeah. uh, quickly about the part, um, like, does your research interest kind of like limit your chances for funding? Um, I just want to say what really helps you get a GSRA in the department is showing that you're passionate, showing how much you care about um, your research topic of interest. So definitely just be honest, be excited about it, and uh, good things will come eventually. Michelle, hopefully we answered your all the pieces, but if not, please feel free to raise your hand again or put it in the chat. Um, but we'll move on to Angel. Angel, what's your question? Hi, everyone. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Yes. Loud as volume. Yes. Um, so um, my question is that, because um, during the introduction, I've heard about a lot of you being involved in research. So I'm just wondering like, what is like the timing of like when you got involved in research was it when like immediately when you enter 
the program, whether it's a PhD or master's, or you kind of like take some core classes, then you get involved in research. Like, do we need specific skills before um, getting involved in research um, in the program? And my second question is, uh, do you like, is there like um, graduate school housing provided uh, for the department or within the School of Public Health? If not so, uh, if you don't mind sharing kind of like, how did you like find housing um, as students? Cause you're all from like, many different parts of the world. So just wondering. So first, who wants to handle the research question? Maybe a master's student would be good to, to answer that. Um, yeah, I can take that one. Damn, great. Um, so I, I actually came in uh, as a GSI. Uh, I wasn't involved in research my first semester, um, but I, you know, I really wanted to get some research experience under my belt. So I started contacting faculty in the department um, and I asked Bramari, our chair, if she had any ideas. I told her what I was interested in, and she actually helped uh, hook me up with a GSRA in the epidemiology department. Um, so, yeah, I like I sought out this appointment, and I at first I wasn't really sure what it would you know entail, but um, it it was really cool being like it is really cool. I'm still a part of that GSRA, uh, uh, being like the biostat kind of expert in that group. Right. So even though they know I'm a master's student, I don't have, you know, complete expertise of all of these subjects. Um, but, you know, if you if you really want to get research experience, then just seek it out. Right. Email people, go talk to faculty. And if they can't offer you funding, then they can direct you to someone who can. I would sorry, I would second that. Um, I also came in as a GSRA and I found my sorry as a GSI and I found my GSRA by just like talking with Nicole. Nicole was really helpful for that. Um, and then like cold emailing faculty and being like, these are my interests. Here are the pieces of your research that I'm interested in hearing about. And then just like getting to know more of what faculty were doing. Um, and then that's how that worked. Yes, I will just reiterate that the funding thing is something that the department matches. So often um, students can't just like ask around and start working with someone, it does have to go through the department. So like Abby said, she was working with Nicole, it went through the department. So we were able to, to do that. Um, not all master students do get research opportunities, but as you have heard, many um, either seek them out or are accepted with those opportunities. The next question was about housing. Um, can, yeah, Elizabeth? I can also combine it with one I saw in the chat about cost of living and funding and how yes, that works great. out. Um, so I think for housing, most of our students, so that you do have housing through the university at Munger Graduate Residences and the Northwood Housing Complex. And so Northwood is north of campus, and that's more, I think, intended primarily for families, although there are students who also live there. I think part of it's family housing and part of it is students. A lot of our students live in Northwood. Munger is, um, I think, large apartments where eight graduate students can, can split. But although those are great options, particularly like depending on constraints you might have, I think most of our students live in apartments around Ann Arbor. I hope I'm correct characterizing that. You can find those. There's um, a housing website through the university. I think it's called offcampushousing.umich.edu. I can put that in the chat. And also, like I found most of my apartments through Craigslist, to be honest. Like You have to be a little careful, but it, I've found some great things there. Um, yeah, so I think that's the majority. You just sort of start looking once you know you're coming to Ann Arbor and see what you can find. And yeah, it works out. In terms of cost of living, um, so I think annual for PhD students, the annual stipend is about 39,000 a year right now, which is um, I think pretty adequate for covering cost of living in Ann Arbor provided you don't have additional expenses like a family or some extremely lavish hobby. Um, so I think, yeah, and I, I think that's usually pretty fine. So I haven't felt major financial stress during my time here, uh, but others feel free to chime in if you disagree. So thanks. That's great, thank you. Uh, you. Erin. Hi, everyone. I also have a question about research. So what are the expectations for publishing and do your mentors or like faculty advisor help you and guide you through the process of publishing? So for this one, Shumik, you want to answer that? Did you hear it? I, yeah, I did. Um, I don't, <laughs> hi, Erin. Um, I don't, I don't think there's an expectation in terms of publishing. So um, of course, while you are working, this is like four to five years of your life, right? So you'll be working on three projects. It's expected that you'll be able to see them through to completion. Um, however, I don't think 
being able to write published or being able to put out published manuscripts is part or requirement that our degree has. Um, however, um, so I'm currently in the process of submitting a draft right now. Um, I do get a great deal of support from my advisor and all other people who are collaborating on the project that I am on. Um, in addition to that, to circle back to what we were seeing about the writing lab, that's also a great resource. Um, so to summarize, I do not think there's a specific expectation on paper, um, but if you do choose or wish to publish, there's a great deal of help. Thank you. Great, thanks. Pablo? Hi, uh, so I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is, can I apply to both the PhD and the master's biostatistics programs? Uh, well, I'll, I'll answer that one. That one, okay, yes, sure. you can. Okay, sounds good. And um, so I know the funding for master's students is limited. So how can you increase your chances of getting fund, uh, funding as a master's student? Maybe I should answer this one too. Um, although I don't have, a, I don't think I have a very good answer to this. Mike, maybe you can chime in as well. Um, we are, we fund some master's students um, who really show interest in, in research in biostatistics and, um, you know, are interested in the PhD program primarily as well. Um, I would say those are the ones um, who are more likely to be funded in the masters. However, we, we have been in this last year prioritizing our funding for our PhD students. Um, I also want to clarify that you can apply to both the masters and the PhD. However, if you apply to the PhD and we don't think you're quite ready or qualified, we will uh, automatically assume that you, or I think there actually might now be a check mark, but we will, we will also consider you for the masters. Which fundamentally means you can just apply for one. Correct. Yeah. So you could just apply for the master's, for the PhD. It'll, it'll save you a little bit of money and save us a little bit of time. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, Quinn. Hi, everyone. So I go to a small liberal arts school. Uh, I'm a senior at it. Um, I believe, Abby, you go to a small liberal arts school, Carrollton, if I'm correct. Um. So I was just wondering, uh, what was the transition like for you coming from a small liberal arts college for undergrad to a big school like Michigan for graduate school? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the same things that happen at a small liberal arts school happen in our department. Like, you know how you know everyone at a small liberal arts school? The exact same ha thing happens here. You can be like, oh, like I had class with so-and-so and they're in so-and-so's lab group. And so you can always find that connection. Um, being a graduate student means you mostly hang out in your department with the people in your cohort. So it might seem like you're going to a really big school, but you're really just going to a school with like whatever size your cohort ends up being. Um, and then it also has all of the pluses of a really big school, like football games, not something that happens at a small liberal arts school, <laughs> um, at least not like it does at Michigan. Um, and so that's been really fun adjusting to it. Um, so yeah, I think it's like super manageable, especially if you're coming from a small liberal arts school, you're used to speaking up in class, going to office hours, like those kinds of things that they really emphasize. Um, that'll prepare you really well for graduate school here. Cool, thank you. Elise. Hello, uh, I also have a question about transitions. So Elizabeth, you mentioned that you came directly from your undergraduate program and that's something I'm considering doing as well so I was wondering um, how that transition was for you and then if you have any suggestions of perhaps classes that would be helpful sure and I also don't think I'm the only person who came straight from undergrad so if other people want to chime in please feel free so for me it was fine um I mean I think it's going to vary from individual to individual but I felt very prepared coming in from an undergrad I think there are pros and cons like coming in straight you're maybe like still really fresh on your math skills uh coming in with more space maybe you've had more time to like develop the kind of like grad student work ethic you need and like you know gain a little bit in emotional maturity but um no, it, it worked out fine. Um, yeah, in terms of classes to take, I mean, I feel like what we have is our requirements, like taking the, the math classes that are necessary, I think is good. Um, if you like have any interest in particular um, areas or like applications, I mean, more of the classes in that regard are good. I feel like about of our PhD students, a, a large, I mean, I'd say, I don't know, some portion come in straight from 
straight from undergrad. Some have worked for a little bit and then come straight to the PhD program. Some have previous masters. So you definitely won't be alone. Yeah. Thank you. Brandon. Thanks. Um, this question may be for Abby, but for anyone else who also has an interest in causal inference, it's something that I'm super interested in. And I was curious if you could talk about kind of what the department has done as it's kind of a, a new burgeoning field in, in many ways and like what your experience has been in your ability to learn that stuff, whether it's through classes or through like other parts of, of your experience. Yeah, um, if anyone else has anything to say on this, feel free to speak up. I feel like I've been talking a lot. Um, I Currently, I am in a class on causal inference. Um, we have a lot of like a really strong like academic heritage almost. I don't know if that's the right word of causal inference. Um, we've got Rod Little, who you'll see on like a bunch of like super seminal papers, is actually currently a faculty member in our department. Um, Mike Elliott, who I don't know if you've read anything by him, is in our department. He's teaching our causal inference class. He has a bunch of research students. So there's definitely like a big group of students who are working causal inference. And even if you don't like directly do a thesis in causal inference, there are a lot of other people who have research interests that are touching on causal inference. So people who do um, mobile health research they also have a lot of causal inference-like questions. There are a couple of people in my lab group who are working on mobile health and then causal inference um, and doing some interesting research there. Um, yeah, so I think like definitely anything that you want to understand at Michigan Biostats or like are interested in, you can find like five faculty who do something on it. And if the faculty that you're talking to at that moment in time doesn't, they can point you in a good direction. So like that was one of the things that was really exciting to me was just like how like great of a breadth that Michigan has in our department. Thanks, that was super, super helpful. All right, great. There's also a question in the chat about what's the typical class size for a biostatistics course? Daniela, how, are, how, how big are your courses? Um, well, I guess that uh, depends. I would say like uh, for my first year, um, we have probably like 50 people um, in my classes. That's because uh, the first year you have to take all of the mandatory courses. So like the entire cohort is taking like the same courses more or less. Um, at least for me, that seemed like a big change because I come from a university where like there are not like that many people in a class. However, like you have all of the resources. Um, there is something that I really like that even though like we have, for me, that was a huge class. Uh, you can get like one-on-one -on -one time with the professors, with the GSI. There's also a lot of like study groups. So you also get like more time to work with uh, your classmates. Um, and that was the first year. And now in the second year you get out, like you can like, choose different electives and those electives tend to be like um smaller classes more probably like 30 people per class yes that's great apostolos uh hi i have a question for the phd students specifically uh so i wonder what it was like for you all going from like running linear regression models or uh doing simple proofs like show that this estimate is unbiased and going from that to doing original methodological research especially in things like uh, biomedical imaging or genetics, uh, which might be things that you weren't exposed to in your master's degrees or even undergraduate careers. Alicia, do you want to say something? Maybe Elizabeth or Shumik too? I think there's a large learning curve, um, but like specifically for me, I didn't have any genetics background coming in. So I was like fortunate to be part of the genome science training program because I did have a math background and they saw something in my uh, statement that's like, you look like you like genetics research. And it's like, sure. And it's been great. Um, I really like, there's like kind of required courses or rec for the GSTP. So like taking statistical methods for human genetics, um, really helped me get a good understanding because I feel like for maybe some of the other, for a lot of PhD students, you kind of learn what you need for your projects. 
and um, you don't need to learn everything. So I feel like uh, I having certain classes that do go over a large breadth of topics, that was really nice. And then it kind of helped me get a better understanding of what aspect in statistical genetics really interested me and what kind of research I would then want to be working on. And then um, my advisor has been really supportive as well because a lot of the things I just had to learn, you know, like working with the cluster and Linux, that's like the first thing, like the first barrier to actually getting to do research that you want to do is like, how do I work with the computer and all of this? Um, so I think it's just having a lot of patience and not being too hard on yourself, you know, like you will get the theory um, that you need in the core courses um, and then everything you want, you will kind of learn. Um, but yeah, it's mostly just being patient and like perseverance and I don't know, still working on it, but I, I, I'm enjoying my time though. So um, I, I think like my first project, I didn't realize how much I had done until my advisor's like, you've pretty much wrapped up on this project. We can start thinking about the next project. And I was like, really, you think this is good enough for like a first project? And he was just like, yeah. So it's really hard, like also as a first generation student, like I don't really know what like qualifies as a project or not. And um, you kind of like just get there. Like you've done so much work and you don't realize you've done all of this work um, but your advisor tells you, no, like this is what you kind of get a better understanding of how like the three project process works kind of rambled. I don't know if any other uh, PhD students have any insight. Anything else to add, Elizabeth or Shumi? I don't think so. I feel like Alicia covered it pretty well. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's great. Are there any other questions, Brandon? I don't know if you have a new question or if your hand's just still raised, but. Oh, whoops. That's why I'm that's, still. Running. That's Thank okay. <laughs> I thought that was maybe the case. Sarah. Hi. So I'm interested in the MS program specifically, and I'm coming from an undergraduate biostatistics degree. So I'm just wondering for people with like a biostats background in particular, if it's common to not place out of, but I guess take alternatives to the core courses if you've already taken really similar courses in undergrad. Did any of you analysts come from a biostat background? So I did. Um, in fact, I think Sarah, we came out of the same program, maybe if I'm guessing from the chat. Um, yeah, so I came out of the UNC biostat program. Um, so I think it depends. I mean, so I was going to the PhD program so I wanted like a very solid foundation so I didn't try to I think I at the time when I was there it may have changed since I graduated I think I was exempted from I think our public health requirement just because the UNC biostat program had such a public health focus um, but I do know of other students who came out of the UNC biostat program who did seek to have classes exempted um, so I think it sort of is going to depend on what you want to do um, yeah but it, it's not unheard of but it also it's going to vary from person to person I think I'm happy to talk more if you want to like shoot me an email. Um, I can I'll message you in the chat. So yeah, Sarah, there would be a process for that. So you would submit what you're interested in um, being exempt from, and it would go through our curriculum committee, and they would have to okay that um, and figure out you know the credits in the course that you would take instead. Apostolos. Um, so this is a question for anyone, I suppose. Uh, so in one of the slides, I noticed that uh, you mentioned that things changed a bit during COVID, but now uh, classes are back to normal for the most part and all in person. Uh, but there were some things about the pandemic that were good in terms of education, like a lot more courses became available for distance students, uh, or maybe the format of the course changed a bit, and then courses were recorded or um, course materials were available online. So I was wondering if uh, you have retained any of the the positive uh, educational side effects, I suppose, of the the pandemic. Yeah, uh, I can answer that. So, um, yeah, during the pandemic, you're right. Like all the classes were recorded. Um, everything was on Zoom. And some of the things that did stay um, is that I, a lot, if not all, of the biostat courses are still being recorded um, and available online after every lecture. 
um, which is really, really nice to be able to go back and, you know, look over the lecture, um, use that to study. If you're sick, you know, you can't go to class, you can, you know, um, watch the recording later and then, you know, ask questions after that. So that's one of the really big positives that I've noticed. Um, I don't know if anyone else has anything to add. I have not taken classes in a while, but um, I think one thing that was maybe first started in the COVID year was the study groups that people had mentioned previously. I think that was based off of recommendations um, from previous years, but it was especially important during the COVID year because students get didn't get to interact with each other. So the study groups are study groups for the core courses that um, I think the department gets senior students to tutor like eight students at a time. So like in the in 601, I think specifically is where they have these study groups. And so that also helps a lot with the transition into like your first semester. And maybe like if you did come from a smaller school um, and you're used to having more one-on-one -on -one attention oh. from professors, um, this is like one opportunity to get to meet other students in your class and then get to meet a older student, your tutor, and just gives you like one extra resource um, throughout your semester or your time here. So I think that's like one thing that was started during COVID, not necessarily because of COVID, I think just based off suggestions from previous years, but um, was important that year and stayed this year and hopefully will be here for the next few years because I really like the idea of the study groups. Um, just to add something else, um, you mentioned something about the materials. Um, for all of the classes that I have taken so far, if, like every possible single material that you need, it's posted on Canvas, which is a platform that we use. Um, to give you an example, this semester I'm taking a course with the professor, like writes everything on the board, um, but he is still writes down notes, types notes, and then upload the notes into Canvas. So even if you kind of go to class or like you miss for some reason, you were sick, you see the recording, but you also have uh, some like material that he types and like he uploads to Canvas in that like um, Asian area. Really great. So I think we're kind of at the end of our allotted time, but I do want to ask the students um, one more question. So um, a quick sentence for each one of you of um, what kind of advice you would give these students. So either in preparation of their application and or as they step into the doors as a graduate student. Um, I'm curious as to what you what words of wisdom you could give to the students listening. So um, who's actually ready? to answer this question. Alicia, you get to go first. I remember when I was applying, I was maybe like kind of shy or not aggressive and like talking to people, like I didn't want to bother them, you know? And so I think that really hindered um, like some of my pro prospects at different like universities um, because they like maybe assumed that I was like interested or like not interested in funding or whatever. So if you're interested in a particular funding resource or working with a specific professor or whatever, don't be too shy. Just send that email. That's great advice. Mike, you're next. Saw your hand. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would definitely second what Alicia said. Don't be shy to reach out to people and ask questions. But something I would also add to that is your grad school experience is a place you're going to work and develop your um, assets for research or industry or whatever, but it's also a place you're going to like interact with people on a daily basis. So I would also take into consideration when you consider a program, um, the kind of people you'll meet for each school and just the overall vibe of each program and go somewhere that you think you'll be able to call home for however many years you're there. That's great. Thank you. Daniela. Um, I think my advice goes along uh, what Mike just said. Um, I'm an international student. I'm from Colombia. And I think one of the hardest things that I have ever have done in my life is coming here, move here. This is an entirely different culture. They, we, like, English is not my first language. Um, so my advice uh, is to build a community where you are. Um, graduate important is graduate life is important like doing well in your courses is important but it's also important to have a balanced life so build a community where you are make good friends make connections 
and uh, enjoy your life here, not only for the courses that you're taking, not only for the research that you're doing, but also because you can call this place home. That's very important. Take care of your mental health. That's excellent. Thank you so much. Sarah. I was going to say pretty much the same thing as Daniela, but um, I would just emphasize even more, like make sure when you first get here, your first semester, just to have a lot of fun, uh, be social. I wasn't the most social person in undergrad and I've really gone outside of my comfort zone and have like a million friends in this department now. So definitely stress less, have more fun. <laughs> it's good life advice in general, right? Sam. Yeah, I was actually going to say the exact same thing. Uh, so yeah, I was going to say when I first got here, my first semester, you know, classes were a lot harder than classes I was used to, right? And that's going to happen wherever you go to graduate school. It, classes are tough. So you are going to have to be spending a lot of time studying, but you can't let, you know, school take over the, your entire life. So I, I agree with what Sarah and Daniela both said. Uh, take time, you know, you can study, but then take a break, relax, go hang out with your friends, right? And like the studying will get done. So make sure you have a good time while you're in graduate school. That's great. Abby. Um, I would say like for applying and then once you get in, if it's here or other places, like you can only control what you do. Um, and like a lot of the time it's going to feel like a lot of things are out of control, like application rejections or acceptances. Those are going to feel out of your control. Classes are going to feel out of your control at times, but like just like breathe. Everything will be okay. Um, and like find ways to like take care of yourself. Like I think everybody else has said. It's a wonderful um, focus on wellness here. I really like it. Um, Elizabeth. I feel like I would echo everything, everything else, everything everyone else has said. Uh, I guess one thing I'd add maybe is to like be open to mentorship and like seek it out when you have it and don't be afraid to ask people for mentorship. I mean, I feel like I um, spoke with so many students when I was deciding where to go and also faculty members with my own institution and I think you might be surprised sometimes by how generous people are willing to be with their time if you have questions um, so yeah and also if you have someone who you think could be a mentor even if maybe they don't seem like a traditional choice I, I wouldn't be afraid to take advantage of that because I think that can offer a lot that's great and Shumik you get the last wise word here yeah all the good answers are gone anyway um, but um, yeah I think Everything that everyone said, um, I, I completely agree with. Um, I think when I was applying myself, I had a lot of trouble writing the statement of purpose and basically my reason for applying to Michigan Biostats and coming to grad school in general. Um, that's a really important document, as anyone on the admissions committee will tell you. Um, please do take time and take a lot of time and think about what you're putting on that document. Um, because you don't really get to talk to advisors or um, the admissions committee. Um, you're just a piece of paper eventually. So make sure that it's a well-constructed document, please. That's great. Thank you so much. Well, the formal part of our presentation tonight is over. However, um, there is opportunity to stick around and go into some breakout rooms and or stick around in this larger room, depending upon how many people are there to talk to additional faculty. So Jeremy Taylor, um, who is the, uh, uh, the head of the Cancer Center Biostatistics Training Program, Mike Binky is along, Pei Song Han, is here. He's the chair of our diversity equity or co-chair of our diversity equity and inclusion um, committee. So is there any other faculty? I think those three are willing to stay here um, later. And so if you're interested, um, please feel free to stick around and we can either put you in a um, breakout room and or anyone can just stick around and ask questions. Um, otherwise, feel free to email any of us. Nicole, Fatma, myself, um, and we can connect you to students if that's what you'd like to do as well. So thank you so much for coming. This recording will be up on the website. Um, I think we'll also send it out via email and otherwise you can stay along and um, meet some of the other faculty. Thanks everyone for joining us and I'll again put in a plug for our November 5th in-person oh, yeah. prospective student day, nine to three a Saturday. 
uh, again, a lot of these kinds of activities and also more opportunity to, to meet with people and hear about research that's going on in the department. Thanks for coming. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. So Alicia, let's see. Yes, so I already have breakout rooms in case we anybody wants to go meet with any of the professors individually, but we can see how many people are left. Yes. And you can start asking questions or yes, whatever. Pablo. Yeah, so I was also wondering if um, if there's an opportunity to do research outside of the Department of Public Health related to statistics, of course. So, so the the model, are we talking dissertation or before dissertation or what are you thinking, Papa? Mm, um, yeah, sure, dissertation, yes. So, so for the dissertation, there's the model in which you can have two faculty advisors for your doctoral committee. Um, and they can be two within your home department, say biostatistics, but you can also have a, a co-advisor who's in another department. And that's a way to encourage uh, a broader range uh, of activities for, for a dissertation. It's still, if you're a biostatistics student, it still needs to be something that can be thought of as biostatistics. But I personally have a very broad definition of what biostatistics is. And so having, having a, a department, uh, a colleague from bioinformatics would not be unusual, from epidemiology would not be unusual, from human genetics would not be unusual. I've done, I've had co-advising situations where I was one of the advisors and someone from each of those departments were, were co-advisors. And so, so things like that can certainly happen. It's a matter of sorting out, you know, with whom you want to work, what kind of problems you want to work on, and, um, and, and going from there. Thank you. Jeremy, maybe you can introduce yourself um, instead of just me saying a few words about you, and then we'll have Kaysong do the same. So the and I'll be different. right back. I've got to get the plug in for my computer. It's about okay. to die. <laughs> Hi, everyone, for hanging around here. So yeah, I'm Jeremy Taylor. I've been in the professor in the department. I've been here 20 four years, I think now. Um, and I do a variety of sort of statistical methods, research, longitudinal data and survival analysis and missing data and a bit of causal inference and some clinical trials and um, lots, lots of different things like that. And I, I run this cancer biostatistics training program, which I think Kelly described briefly. Um, so I'm happy to talk about that or answer general questions. I've been involved with the admissions committee many, many years in a row. So very knowledgeable about the expectations here. Hey, Song, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, <clears throat> hello, everybody. Hey, Song Han. I am a associate professor in the department. So um, I, I was actually a PhD student. Uh, I graduated from this department. Uh, I studied here uh, 2008 to 2013. And then I, I went to a university, uh, university of Waterloo as a faculty, but then I came back to join the department in 2018, January 2018. So um, I, while well, my own research, well, I actually, I really wish that, uh, you know, when I applied for the PhD program here, there was, you know, this uh, prospective student event because back, in, uh, back then when I applied, I really didn't have, you know, um, so I had a I had a couple of friends. I knew someone from the department, so I, I could ask them about you know some information, but not as much as you know uh, the information as uh, as one would be able to get from this uh, from such an event. So my own research, uh, I uh, uh, currently I'm, I'm uh, knowledge wise I'm doing data integration. That's combining data from you know, from different sources, and also I have. Uh, um, uh, I have a, a large interest in missing data analysis as well, and causal inference and biased sampling generally. And my collaboration, I have a collaboration with uh, with the CAC, the CUNY Epidemiology Cause Center, and also I have collaboration with the uh, 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 researchers from Department of Psychiatry. So I I'm happy to answer any questions you guys may have. 
Thank you so much. So feel free to write any questions in the chat or to speak up. So can I just make a comment? So I heard lots and lots of questions about research. So I'm not sure. I mean, there's sort of two forms of research from a student perspective. One is you're a PhD student and you've done your classes and then you're doing a dissertation and then you're working closely with an advisor or two and developing sort of new statistical methods, generally something akin to that. There's also quite a bit of research that goes on as students involved in GSRA, graduate student research assistantship projects. Sometimes they're funded, sometimes they're sort of volunteering in that and they're it might not be statistical research, but it's sort of more scientific research in, in some area. And so that's a, it's a place which, you know, uh, new students could get involved in that, uh, you know, even PhD students and master's students potentially. So there's, there's both of those sort of things happen. Sarah, question? Yeah, this is pretty specific, but Mike, I know you said you do work in genetics and I'm currently doing research with omics and cardiometabolic risk factors, but also social determinants of health. And so I was just wondering whether you or other faculty are working on projects like that, more genetic epidemiology type projects. Yeah. Yeah, we have a strong concentration in statistical genetics and genetic epidemiology in the School of Public Health, primarily in biostatistics, but, but also with some very good colleagues in, in the Department of Epidemiology. And so between the two, you'd, you'd see a very broad range uh, of opportunities. Um, my focus is not so much on social determinants of health, but, um, but we do have other faculty who are quite interested in those. And, it's a matter of getting the, the best data for addressing the problems that interest you. What, what particular area interests you? Um, right now I'm looking at psychosocial stressors. I don't know particularly like what exactly I would be interested in. I'm interested in like pursuing other things other than what I'm researching in undergrad, but like having the background in it, it'd just be interesting to see what's being done. Yeah. yeah, there's certainly faculty in our department interested in psychosocial determinants of health. And as I say, in epidemiology, some of the genetic epidemiologists there have that as a primary focus. Thank you. And some of those folks are fact training faculty on our genome science training program. Uh, hi, I also have a question. Um, I have a specific question for Dr. Mike. Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Um, Mike is easier. <laughs> sorry, what was that? Yeah, Mike I would just call easier. you Dr. Mike, yeah. Just so call me I'm, Mike. Yeah, um, I'm currently an undergrad at University of Michigan, and I'm actually pursuing my bachelor's degrees in uh, molecular biology. But then after a short, after working in the wildlife for a while, I realized that this is not what I really want to pursue. And I, I was actually looking for opportunities to work in labs at, uh, pub, you, you know, at the School of Public Health. But because of my major is actually in biology instead of statistics, Although I have been taking classes uh, in stats, but it's pretty introductory, and um, I didn't. I sent uh, I sent out some cold emails, but then I didn't really get some response. So I was, was just wondering, like, do you know, like, whether like maybe um, Center of Statistic Genetics are recruiting or have some uh, so have some opportunities for undergraduate? We 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 have some, but but typically they go to people who have done a fair amount of computing already. So, so if you've done you know, some R or Python, um, ideally both, um, that would be a good background for, for, for getting involved. And so if you have those, I'd stress those in the uh, email you'd be sending. And if you don't, that's something I'd, 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 I'd get because for, for you know, lab work and statistics are a little bit different. Uh, my, my wife, for example, is a faculty member in it epidemiology and has a lab. And if an undergraduate's interested in working with her, even totally unskilled, people can always wash dishes. And of course, it's not quite as basic as that. 
but but it can go from there and start there and go further. In in biostat, we we need people to have some statistics and some, some computing to really be able to do something useful and interesting. And so, if you've got that introductory statistics and you can get a little bit of computing, that that'd be where I'd start before trying too hard to find something. The other thing you could consider is this Big Data Summer Institute that I mentioned. It's a great way to get involved in some research and some additional training uh, in statistics and computation in this six-week summer program. And if you were to do that program, you'd then be beautifully positioned for, for finding something after. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Derek. Um, uh, hello. Uh, I had uh, more of a specific question uh, relating to research interests. So uh, I was looking at the faculty research interests page and I was uh, especially drawn towards more applied topics in clinical trial research, such as sleep disorders, mental health and substance abuse. So I'm wondering how niche these specific interests are within the department and whether I should mention this in my, in my application or whether I should also include uh, research interests outside of these as well. And uh, whether um, I should mention these faculty members regardless of whether uh, they're accepting of students right now. Jeremy, you wanna answer? I was just gonna say that's a question for you, right? For, for really? About clinical trials. <laughs> yeah, so. well, you do a little bit of that. Too. You do a little bit of that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, there are several of us in the faculty who are interested in clinical trials research, some of which are in those specific areas and some of which are in other areas. Um, you can certainly be as detailed as you'd like on your statement of purpose. Um, I think as some of the other students said, that doesn't mean that that's necessarily what you will do. Um, but if that's what you're interested in, you should definitely let us know. Um, and you can put down the faculty that you see are doing that research um, that helps personalize it to our department that you've done that research and you're interested in us. Um, and then again, we don't accept like specific faculty do not accept students. So um, it you don't really know which faculty are taking students or not usually um, when you're applying and um, you don't have to be funded by that student, that faculty to work with that faculty on your dissertation eventually. Um, and so I wouldn't limit, I wouldn't let that limit your writing and or interest in, in the program necessarily. Uh, all right, thank you. Yeah. I think it's fair to say people had a very quick, oh, sorry, Jeremy, go ahead. I was gonna say, it's fair to say a lot of students, you know, when they're applying have, interests but they they frequently change and evolve as they they come and get involved in research projects and, and some of them set in stone but it's very very common to to morph into into something else i mean partly just through their exposure in a research assistant type position or or something like that so so we, we, we're interested to hear what you what you're interested in but we understand that it changes too yeah, that's right. That's actually what I was uh, uh, going to say as well. So I think the one one uh, advantage, one great thing about this department is that we offer a variety of uh, different courses. I'm sure Kelly uh, and uh, and Mike they talked about this. So we have a a large number of courses offered, and so um, and also we have different uh, research projects. And uh, I, I think uh, many students uh, they uh, after they got here, they actually have the opportunity to. Uh, you know, explore different research area or different topics, and uh, that uh, that actually pro provides more information about which uh, you know which area they would like to go in the end. I should, I should say, I mean, the, there's a change in the last five years. I mean, more, many more of the classes now, particularly at the master's level, have, have projects associated with them. There'll be a lot of projects associated. In, in classes sort of the final aspect of a class would be a project so you get sort of experience and exposure to, to research in that even when you're sort of a you know a first year master's student
Hey, Pablo. Uh, yes, so I am. Um... Uh, even though I'm very excited to apply to UMICH, I have to say that I am a little intimidated uh, because I uh, come from a relatively unknown university. So I want to know uh, how much do you care for the reputation of my home institution? We care much more about your, um, your, you know, background and your, um, aptitude at what you've been studying than the name of your institution. And tell us what you're interested in in your statements. That's that's your opportunity to really make clear your excitement, your passion, why biostatistics is a good fit for you, why perhaps our department is a particularly good fit for you. Those things are incredibly important as we go through those 700 applications. Um, we, 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 we need to see something like that. And it's very helpful. And it's actually, I think, as much as it's a, a burden to, to write those statements, I think it's a real opportunity to be thinking for yourself, not just for the application, but for yourself, what it is that excites you and what you want to be doing going forward in these next few years that may not be the career for the rest of your life, but, but could be. Um, and so be thinking, be taking that opportunity to take time for yourself and think about what really matters to you. Thank you. Yeah, and I don't know on the admissions committee, but I feel like coming from like a institution that's not, like not well known, that makes you special in your own way. And you can highlight that. And I feel like um, I came from University of New Mexico, which is not, I don't feel like well, well known, but I think um, I, the opportunities that I had experienced from my home institution, I was able to highlight that in my application because they did do a good job at preparing me for this um, program and to be successful. So I feel like um, highlight what makes you different and that'll take you a long way. And I actually read Alicia's application because <laughs> I was chair of the admissions committee in those days and also read it for the genome science training program. Talk about yourself and what, what's important, what you're excited about, and um, the rest will take care of itself. Sorry, I wanted to ask Alicia, did you say you, you went to University of New Mexico? Mm-hmm. Yes. That's, that's so funny. I, um, I'm going to New Mexico State right now. <laughs> yeah. Yay! New Mexico <laughs> representation. <laughs> yes. You are our rivals, but it's not as big as a rivalry as uh, University of Michigan and Ohio State. So I feel like we can still be friends. <laughs> <I'm not laughs> Only um, if you come to University of Michigan, though. <laughs> yes, hopefully, hopefully. So I think I'm actually going to tap out, um, but I will let Alicia continue to facilitate this wonderful discussion. And um, thank you to all those who, who came. So good night for me. Thank you, Kelly. So there was a, um, a question and answer in the chat about the summer program. So that's a sort of an undergraduate six week summer program. I don't know if you talked about it, Mike, earlier. But we did. It does, okay. It has about 40, 40 slots, and those are the ones that are the, the ones that get the stipend. So. No, it's a great program. And I know Jeremy speaks in it periodically, and I do as well, other, other faculty too. It's led by our Chair Bramar Mukherjee and, and our colleague Matt Zawistowski and Sebastian Zerner. And there are multiple faculty, multiple uh, current students who take part in leadership roles in the program. And you know, all the students I talk to really enjoy it. And um, it's honestly also one of our best direct routes to our graduate program is students who take part in our Big Data Summer Institute. Well, maybe are we running out of questions at this point? Is it a good time to uh, follow the evening? I mean, can I just say that the people want like private questions, because we could go into 
breakout rooms if someone want, wants that sort of thing, if you don't want to air your question in front of everybody else, but that's, that's feasible. Yes, just let me know. Pardon me for eating my popcorn, but I didn't get very much dinner before we started. <laughs> Peter? Uh, I see your hand raised, Peter. Do you have a question? You're on mute. Hello, good. Yeah, I have a question. Okay. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, I have a wide range of interest in uh, epidemiologists of Baustats. So I'm a bit like not clear on what to really put in my SOP or who to really target like which area to target. For example, I, I have worked on um, a research on psychosocial mobilities of caregivers of cancer patients, uh, which is like more, more or less of communicable diseases. And I've also been involved in um, lots of um, infectious diseases research, especially when it comes to um, infectious diseases of um, um, that include that, um, um, Diarrhea, diarrhea agents causing diarrhea, such as um, cholera and um, cholera, and um, I've also been involved in a lot of So um, I so far I've not been able to to I mean get a to 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 listen from a professor who is really doing what I have interest in. So my question is, is there anyone at Michigan who is actually involved in, is it vaccine trials now, um, especially targeted at um, diarrhea diseases? So any faculty interested in vaccine research and the different um, diseases that you mentioned, right? So like cholera? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, and part of your concern was um, not knowing like what to kind of highlight. Um, exactly, because I, I, the, the, my experience cuts across non-communicable diseases and communicable diseases. Okay. So I'm not really, I don't really know which one to tie it to. Should I just focus on the non-communicable disease? Will I get a lecturer in that, I mean, a, a supervisor in that area? Or should I focus on the infectious diseases part if I will get someone to supervise me in that area? Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd emphasize what you're most excited about. And, you know, we honestly, we have more faculty focused on non-communicable diseases. But with, with COVID-19, we now have a lot of our faculty who are actually involved in in infectious diseases that, you know, if you'd asked me five years ago, I would have said essentially no one uh, was, was with that focus. So, so with an interest in infectious diseases um, fits now with quite a few of our faculty and our epidemiology department, which my wife happens to be a faculty member in, has a strong focus in infectious diseases. So between the two, there'd be really good opportunities if that's the way you want to go. On the other hand, if you're more interested in non-communicable diseases, if you're interested in cancer, for example, as you mentioned, talk about that. It reveal something that you can describe as being excited about. You don't have to write about absolutely everything you've ever done. Um, talk about what you think you're interested in focusing on. And maybe my advice would be like to focus on which particular like methods you're interested in, because like this is the biostatistics department, but you are, if you are going to the PhD program, you do have to have somebody from a, outside of the biostatistics department on your committee. So there you can get maybe somebody from the epidemiology um, department that might have like a more, might be more aligned with the specific diseases that you're interested in researching. Um, but then like the biostatistics really should be like the methods that you're interested in applying and like you'll like learn about methods and in infectious disease and whatnot. So uh, I don't know if that helps. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, but I, I, I still have another question. Mm -hmm. um, I think my question is to um, Professor, I mean, Professor Mike now. I um, have described my experiences and 
do you think do you think crossing to either genomics or to cancer research with the experiences i've had do you think that is possible absolutely it it really comes down to what do you want to do how do you want to take your career forward what do you want to study what would you be excited about doing um you know fundamentally if you have the math prerequisites and you have the interest um i think you can go in in any direction you'd like and you know taking advantage of your past experience can give you a leg up but but you don't have to um you need the mathematics you need the excitement and the interest uh to pursue what you want to do all right thank you so much Okay, any other last questions? Okay, I think then we'll call it a night. Uh, thank you all for who stayed till the end of the hour. Thank you to our faculty here that were here to answer questions. Um, I just want to reiterate, if you have any additional questions, don't be shy to reach out to any one of us. Um, and yeah, anything else that y'all faculty want to add? Thanks a lot for coming. Really a pleasure to chat with you. Well, nice to see all of you who are still here. You made it to the end. <laughs> yeah, I just want to encourage you guys to apply. It's a great place to be. I should tell the three students who are still here. I remember Alicia, you came to the Ann Arbor Brewing Company. I remember you. That event there many years ago. Oh no! <laughs> Hopefully, good things. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, sure. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Right. Take care. Bye, everybody. Good night. Bye.